I'm glad the rabbi is here because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions that come up. Uh -oh. so I'm just going to <laughs> in English. Uh, we don't really start the questions, you know, officially until Friday night for Seder, oh. but we can, do, you know. <laughs> uh, blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe. You have sanctified us through your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves in things of Torah. Amen. 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 Well, uh, we are ab about to start. Uh, uh, we're, we're sort of, let me just double check to be sure we're on Exodus. Buddy, would you like me to do the poetical thing first? Uh, <laughs> Okay, David, go ahead. Okay, last week we were talking a little bit about the Israelites leaving Egypt. We were talking more than a little about it. And the idea of a cloud by day. And Marty made the comment about a cloud symbolizing loneliness, which of course reminded me of Wordsworth and the poem that I'd like to read you right now. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretched a never ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, losing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not be but gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash along that upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Thank you very much. Very nice. Yes. Thank you, David. Oh, uh, David, not to disrespect your poem at all, but uh, Bullwinkle and Rocky the Flying Squirrel have a great cartoon version of that. And I, I, yeah, I've, I've seen it. But remember it, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. Thanks. It's us a little bit. You know. Thank you. Thanks for mentioning. <laughs> but but it's, it's, speaking, a, it's, a, it's a Wordsworth mid midrash, right? Yeah. That's right. Uh, in other words, every cloud has a silver lining. Some people may remember that song. Uh, anyway, uh, just so we are on Exodus uh, thirteen. Uh, we uh, and uh, we are. Uh, it it may be reasonable. I, I think we we begin on verse nineteen. I think I think that's where we we begin today. And uh, and if uh, someone, I'm would... sorry, uh, Marty. What chapter? Sorry, I missed the chapter. Exodus 13. 13 verse 19. Uh, 13 verse 19. Verse 19. Okay. okay. Would you like me to begin? Uh, uh, yes, and, that will be okay. And okay. Moses took. Oh, wait a minute. Every I okay. I I. Uh, why don't why don't we let uh, Michael read? He usually doesn't read. We'll come back. We have enough time to to get everyone in. So and, and Moses ahead, took with him the bones of Joseph, who had exacted an oath from the children of Israel, saying, "God will be sure to take notice of you. Then you shall carry up my bones from here with you." Okay, that's a good place to stop, Michael. I, I agree. Any comments or ideas? Well, maybe we need another question. Why is this stated in this fashion? Mm -hmm. 
why was it important for Joseph to picking up on the theme that we have discussed before, remember very sound. Why was it important for Moses to, to remember about Joseph? Thank you. It is unusual because the Jewish tradition is very Shakespearean and that, uh, you know, curse be he who moves my bones. Once you are buried, you stay there. But God has made an exception with Joseph, uh, perhaps because he is one of the patriarchs or very close to one of the patriarchs or the son of one of the patriarchs. But uh, it still is a puzzle thing. It's a good question, Marty. Oh, Marty? If, yes, uh, please, please, uh, Steve. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and maybe that the, the rabbi can can comment on this, but to the best of- Rabbis, my, Rabbi Miri's yeah. here also. Yes, oh, oh ra rabbis. rabbis. That's right. Yeah, yeah but- to the best of my knowledge, actually, that was a, a very common custom among the Jews for long periods of time that actually the, uh, the bones were removed and ultimately put in an ossuary. That was a, you, you know, burial uh, technique. So, so the bones were, you know, the, the body was left somewhere, you know, to decompose, protect it in a protected area, but then the ultimate burial was collecting the bones and putting them in an ossuary. And, and of course, this, this uh, is very important in this scenario because they, there's an important in, in, there's an importance in establishing the continuity of the people that, uh, you know, the uh, patriarchs are directly connected with this generation that's uh, leaving um, Egypt. That's a very important part of our, you know, in quotation, Jewish mythology, that it goes all the way back to Abraham very clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rabbi. Yeah, I, I oh, I'm sorry. Add, Steve, Steve's okay. correct. Uh, and then add that according to Halakha, there are only two reasons why uh, you may exhume a body and, and bury it el elsewhere. One is to bury it in Israel. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then the other is, the, is if the civil authorities uh, you know, mandate that for some reason, a criminal investigation or whatever, or a pandemic or something, that if they need to exhume the body. Otherwise, we just went I just went through this with a particular family last year. Uh, otherwise, exhuming a body would be a disrespect of, of the dead, and halakha would be against it. Okay. Grace, you've had your hand up for a while. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, Grace. All right. Thank you. Um, I just was kind of focusing on the questions that are literally asked here who had exacted an oath from the children of Israel. So Moses took with him the bones of Joseph. So Joseph got this oath from whom, right? God will be sure to take notice of you as a statement. Then you shall carry up my bones from, oh, so Moses is telling Joe, I'm confused with this verse. So I need some clarity as to who's speaking about whom. Uh, Moses isn't dead yet, right? Correct. He's taking out the bones from uh, of uh, Joseph. Joseph. Joseph passed. So how is Moses? It, who, who told Moses to do this? Was God's. God said, you know, you'll you'll take with and bury him there, whether he's dead or not, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm lost from a previous story, I think. Can you give me a little help with that? Okay, well, let's let's start with with uh uh Jacob. Marty, 
Marcy, yes, go ahead. It, it, it's, it goes back to the end of chapter 50 of Genesis is where the where the the the, the story takes place and Joseph uh, and, and Joseph making the children of Israel pledge. So if people want to look at it, it's the it's the end of the portion and it's the end of chapter 50, the end of the book of Genesis. And Joseph has already, I, I went back a little further because uh, Joseph uh, conducts a, a, there's a caravan, if you will, that leaves Egypt to carry the body of Jacob mm -hmm. to be buried in, uh, in, in the cave uh, alongside uh, 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 Abraham and Isaac. And then it goes on, and, and then what the rabbis said. So the stories are embedded in in the uh, in, in Genesis in in two in in the, the discussion of of what Joseph does, what and what Joseph asked the uh, the Israelites. It's all it, it's all laid out at the end of Genesis, as the rabbi uh, mentions. Yes, Don. I have a similar confusion uh, because um, it's Joseph's bones alone that are being moved, but uh, Jacob and Abraham and Jacob's bones are not going to be disturbed. Um, but I imagine that because Joseph was a, uh, uh, a royal in, in Egypt, that he was in some kind of sargophagus or, or some kind of protected place. And I'm wondering how. Israelites got to the bones to get them out. Sound. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any ideas? You want to repeat your last question? Yeah. How how did uh, Moses and the Hebrews get to Joseph's bones in order to? Take them out. Take them with them. Okay, so it, it, let's come up with our own drosh because it's not. Do you, want, do you want Do you want to hear some of the classic midrash? Sure. sure. All right, hang on one second. There are a lot of there, there's a lot of of, of midrash. Okay. About so bear, yeah, bear with me. How did Moses know where Joseph was buried? It is said, Sarah, the daughter of Asher who was of Joseph's generation, was still living, believe it or not, okay? Moses went to her and asked, do you know where Joseph is buried? She replied, the Egyptians made a metal coffin for him, which they sank into the Nile, in order that its waters might be blessed thereby. Then to the magicians and the sorcerers told Pharaoh, do you wish that this people, the Israelites, shall never leave Egypt? If they do not find the bones of Joseph, they will never be able to leave. So Moses went to the bank of the Nile and called out saying, Joseph, Joseph, the time in which the Holy One swore to redeem Israel has now come, as has the time of the oath that you had Israel swear. Give honor to the Lord, God of Israel. The presence is waiting for you. Israel are waiting for you. If you show yourself, well and good. If not, we shall be released from the oath you made our forebears swear. Immediately, Joseph's coffin began bubbling upward, rising out of the depths as though no heavier than a reed and Moses took it. Rabbi Nathan said, Joseph was buried in the royal sepulchers. That's what Steve was saying, or, or Don was saying. Moses went and stood by these sepulchers saying, Joseph, the time in which the Holy One swore to redeem Israel has come, as has the time for the oath you had Israel swear. If you show yourself well and good, if not, we shall be rele <coughs> released from the oath that you made our forebears swear. At that, Joseph's coffin began to shake. Moses took it and carried it with him. During all the years that Israel were in the wilderness, the ark-like coffin of Joseph and the ark of the presence that's the, uh, that had the tablets moved side by side. When passersby asked, what's the significance of these two arks? They were told this one is the coffin of a mortal and that one is the ark of the, of the eternal presence. But is it proper that a corpse moves side by side with the eternal presence? Israel replied, the corpse in this ark fulfilled all that is written in that one. <laughs> no further questions, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a huge gap. I mean, 
but it, 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 it pointed to one of our prior discussions on remembering. Okay. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. Why do we have uh, celebrations of birthdays? Why do we have celebrations of anniversaries? Why do we have uh, celebrations of, uh, you know, of memory, like a yard site? Okay, why well, we do we do that? We don't, so we don't forget. Uh, yeah. It, it's uh, something that is uh, something to be remembered and repeated year by year, <laughs> simply that we should not forget. And especially when you have loved ones here involved, rem always remember them, have uh, a memory of them uh, uh, for the rest of your life. Okay. What, what, yes, uh, uh, please, R Rabbi Mary. Well, so, Shabbat Shalom. Um, Shabbat Shalom. What, uh, two things regarding the remembering, what's interesting to me is that um, we are not. Um, we are not told to build a, a, a monument for remembrance. What we, uh, what we see as holy is time. So we have these things of times, um, which um, I think it's a very interesting thing uh, versus other religious that, that put monuments. But what I wanted to show is the word e -e letem, and you brought up the bones of Joseph. Mm -hmm. So one can say, well, they were buried, so they brought it up. On the other hand, the issue of going to the promised land is to go up. Even today, we use the word aliyah. So it, it's, it's interesting to me that that word is used we are going to uh, the, the promised land. It's not that we are going, we are going up to the promised land. And it, just as a footnote to what you just said, uh, it, it also in uh, the book of Genesis, we, everyone went down to Egypt. Yeah. Okay, so it so there is there are two directions here, <laughs> but but yes, it, it it's a uh, it is uh, it, it's symbolic. It's symbolic. Uh, any other comments? Uh, this is for the ra a question for the rabbis in the prayers that we say every Sabbath. There are certain words that are reserved for those that are, I guess, orthodox, uh, from the orthodox prayers, uh, speaking about the bones to be, uh, that God has the power to raise the bones of the dead. Any comments about that? How much time do you want to go into this? As much as is needed. <laughs> as much as is needed, because there are some people who feel that the bones of the dead can be moved underground all the way to uh to israel as well yes please well the i think what you're referring to in 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 the specific question is that the traditional wording uh was baruch ataronai mechaye hametin yes is we bless we bless god who gives life to the dead would be a, a a somewhat fair fair translation um and and uh, what's what's referred to in, in as tehiata metim or resurrection of the dead certainly there was a significantly long uh portion or period of jewish history where that was the mainstream belief uh, it, if if it wasn't, we wouldn't have the whole Christian story that that based on the miracle of the resurrection. Um, and and it's there, it's there in in much of the literature, the traditional literature. Um, in the last two hundred years or so, there have been biblical scholars and liturgists who have said, 
Um, we're, we're uncomfortable with that. That's not the way that most Jews believe in, in, a, in, in, a, in a specific, uh, you know, with, that's what happens to us after, after we die. And so when the, not just the reform movement, but when more modern interpretations of traditional literature were being written, they made some, amendment, uh, some amendments and, and re, rewording um some of them led to an understanding of that god god is the author of life god gives life to to everything even even those flowers and plants that seem to have died in the winter but they are born again and they they arise again so so to speak um there are others and certainly this is where the reform movement and the reconstructionist movement later on make the official change rather than just a suggested change. But they made a, an official yeah. change because resurrection of the dead, Tichiat HaMetim, was also linked in the liturgy uh, specifically to the um, uh, uh, rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and to the uh, not only resurrection of the dead, but the resurrection reconstruction of the, the 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 caste system with priests and Levites and Israelites and those who can and those who can't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when they looked at the prayer book, that was one of the initial changes, reforms, if you will, that that they made in the liturgy was rather than saying we praise God who gives life to the dead, we praise God who is the creator of all. Uh, things that are living, things things that are dead, and they eliminated any reference specifically to reconstruction or rededication of the the temple and the reestablishment of the priests and the Levites. That's a that's a what we say pekitzor. That's a you know just a very very quick uh, response to what you're what you're saying. Okay. But there's no there's no there's no question that for a significant period of time in Jewish thinking, philosophy, theology, however you want to approach it, that resurrection of the dead physically, whether it happened along with the arrival of the Messiah uh, and then the establishment of the sacrificial cult again and the day of the temple, you know, whether it, whether it was hand in hand, whether it came before, whether it came after, but that for a long period of time, probably you know, a thousand years, that was the mainstream thinking. Morty? Yeah, I, yes, Steve. And then I know, I don't know who had the hand up first, you or Michael. Like it looks like a, a, a cat. A time, a, a, I, and and the, a, a cat chair. wants to say something, I guess. But uh, Steve and then Michael. Oh, okay. Um, just just a, yeah, a, a quick comment. Um, it, uh, I, I just want verification for, from the rabbi on that, if, if I have this correct. But um, my understanding was that the fair, that the literal team resurrection of the dead was a Pharisaic uh, development, and the Sadducees actually rejected it totally. That the traditional sort of a biblical Judaism. Uh, you know, temple-based Judaism, right. it exactly. wasn't an issue at all. And sure. this was some, I'm not sure how the Pharisees developed the idea. That would be interesting where it came from, or if it was an alien concept that was um, sort or of- an Influence of the Zoroastrian connection or whatever. But you, no, what you're saying is true. Fair, the, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that's one of the major, one of the major issues. And, and, and that isn't it a uh, part of Maimonides' thirteen elements of belief that you know triatome team is part of it, you know, and he was a rationalist actually. Right. He was a, he was very sort of or, oriented towards you know. Afal anima amin. Even though it may be a long time off, I still believe in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Michael. Thank you. Um, I, I want, uh, this is for the rabbis. And I'm asking, in the Orthodox, I believe uh, uh, the rising of the soul, for example, uh, 
uh, before several days before Yom Kippur, uh, Jews uh, congregate, or many do, on, on the cemetery uh, because they believe the rising of the soul or the, the, or the soul's rise at that time and, and people go. If there's any connection between what the rabbi was saying and, and that. Rabbi Mary, you want to go I, it's interesting because last week I was talking about someone asked me uh, what happened uh, according to Judaism after someone dies and I had to elaborate on that and uh, what you're saying Michael may be a symbolic thing that some people do but that's not in the framework of my belief about uh, souls. Uh, so I don't want to get into what that is. Uh, so I, I don't know about that. I know that the Mexicans go to the cemetery and celebrate on the uh, graves of their relatives. But um, I did not hear. It, it, it's me. I, I didn't hear about that. Well, it's funny you mentioned. It's one of the it's, it's funny. Of the yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm going to have Mexican food this afternoon, and I'll ask my waitress what she if she has any information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your soul right. not rise up because of the Mexican <laughs> food. And, and and anyway, you were going to say, Rabbi Roman. No, I was just going to say yes. And, there, and is the, there is there is the Mary. the custom. Of between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, of visiting visiting the graves of, of yes. your ancestors, especially especially your parents, um, I, I I seem to recall that one of the, one of the prayers that that can be recited, and I don't have access to something that right 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 now. Um, it, uh, I I think that there's a Michael. I think what you're referring to is that. Um, that, that one of the prayers or one of the poems that's read has a phrase like may may your soul you know may your spirit rise up and bless us may your soul come and you know and continue to live through us some something like that it's in the back of my mind i don't have the exact test, text before us but i i'd never heard like like miri i'd never heard officially that that, that it, it was a either a, a prayer or a request that people that the souls would would come and live again at that at that time yes don thank you yeah, first thank you very much rabbi norman and steve for that information um yeah I, I know the um connection between the corpus and the spirit is has never been resolved over the centuries i mean it's back hit back and forth like a tennis ball and, and uh, I recall reading that, that the Pharisees, in fact, fed their thinking into the early Christian um, philosophy of, of resurrection. So there is that remnant. But I, and I also recall in Mexico, on in San Miguel de Allende, on the Day of the Dead, because the town only has a limited size cemetery, they have these racks or where they dig up coffins periodically and put the uh, caskets up on the racks so they can bury the, the dead waiting uh, to be buried, sometimes years, just so they can be buried and, and somehow fulfill the idea of a, of a burial and a, a spirit connection. So I'm, I'm totally fascinated by so many so many different thoughts about a connection between body and spirit and how it's how it, how it's comforted okay thank I, you I, I, uh, I, thank I, you I, helene helene i know you had your hand up helene i did because i'm i'm thinking i keep telling my stories here but i I witnessed and I was part of an Orthodox burial. My own grandmother was buried Orthodox, completely Hasidic, 
the women on one side, the men on the other. And when they lifted her body in the sheets, I saw that, and I was the only child, I was a teenager. I saw my grandmother's body in the sheets, and I thought, ay, ay, ay. And they layered her, put her down into the ground. But what impressed me so much was this was an occasion for the women, not the men, the men were always praying, but the women were crying and screaming and feeling their feelings at this burial. Did anybody else ever experience this orthodox burial? Yes, with yeah. my grandfather. Yeah, oh. Can you say something about but, it? But they hired whalers. Right. Pardon me. To do that. Especially, yeah, the Mizrahi Jews in particular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Steve. Yeah, my, uh, my grandmother, who came with us to Israel, was buried in Israel. Everything in Israel, at least at that time, was orthodox. So, um, I recall that also her body had to be accompanied at all times. Yes. And, oh, yes. And one, uh, and I guess rabbis can elaborate on, you know, what the rationale is, is for that. But I remember having to be in the uh, hearse mm -hmm. uh, with, with my grandmother, you know, along with my brother, who was... Uh, you know, we were the two oldest brothers, so we got uh, that job. And uh, yeah, and it was, I, yeah, I, I don't remember any any sort of uh, um, custom or, uh, you know, the women there, even though it was a, it was a pretty small uh, group, as I recall, and it was um, really only my, this was my maternal grandmother, only my mother was there, and uh, she collapsed at one point and almost fell into the grave, my dad. Right, right, right. right. Um, yeah. But I'm not, I, don't, I don't think she was performing a, a right. I think that it's just something that happened accidentally, you know. Yeah. She yes, Michael. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Michael. Let, let Helene finish. Okay. She, she has to go soon. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, yes, no. Helene. I saw that too. I saw how they wanted to be with, with them in the ground. They cried, they screamed, they carried on. As some, it affected me as a teenager. I had no idea. They just said, you're going with the women. And I said, okay, what do you expect? I want you people to know it took me probably 15 years of trauma before I would go into a cemetery again. Wow. It was so dramatic and so... <clears throat> so sure. I, I wanted to tell you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I want to uh, tell Helene something uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the Orthodox uh, burial continues after the burial. When you get home uh, in the Orthodox, as I remember, mirrors are covered with sheets and uh, you sit sh with sitting shiver on a low stool, I think for a week mm -hmm. with the candle burn, with a seven day candle burning. So it, it's, a, it, it's this is a very, very big deal in the Jewish religion, at least especially in the Orthodox. I'm not sure with reconstruction or the other stuff, but uh, it's it's a very 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 important. It's it's not not just it's done, but the, the reasons and and all of that is. Uh, it's interesting to study to take a study of all of that if you have an interest. And the second thing I would like to do is address uh, Don, for when he talked about the the Mexican uh, culture. That's absolutely true. But it goes also deeper than that throughout the, the entire Hispanic uh, culture, especially in Cuba and Cuba, 
uh, their their religious street is very 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 high and very strong and a lot of this uh rhythms the uh, latin rhythms are played during their their religious burials and that type of thing because i have an interest in latin music i had studied a lot of this stuff years ago thank you uh okay rabbi roman and then rabbi mary uh, oh uh, david you did you just raise your hand or has so it been we'll, up go, we'll, go, we'll go after rabbi mary oh okay okay Okay, I'm going to use this opportunity to uh, invite everybody, whether it's live at the moment or I'm sure it'll be, we'll make sure it's recorded. Uh, in June, I'm going to do a two session. This is just coincidental to, to this discussion uh, and the q and in, in June, I'm going to do a two part series on uh, a some of the traditional morning practices and approach not so much the the theological of uh you know what happens after we die but specifically the questions uh and the patterns and the and the customs of traditional death burial morning practices uh, like as michael was talking about uh from from the traditional that would be part one part two will be more contemporary approaches, not just reform, reconstructionist, conservative, but also within the Orthodox community. And then specifically, what happens, because it's a reality for us, what happens here in Green Valley, in uh -huh. our community? What are the resources available to us? How, what would happen if someone makes a phone call to the temple and <laughs> Stacy refers them to me and whatever, that someone has died? What are the kind of, well, who are our connections with the funeral homes, with the cemeteries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So not only historical, traditional, but also we, we want to make a practical workshop kind of uh, opportunity for our members. That'll be in June. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Rabbi Mary. <clears throat> I also can go. Uh, the reason is that uh, we have so many traditions and traditions are not law from the Torah. Right. So, so they evolve and they borrow from all kinds of places. Yes. So uh, you might see things that you say, well, that's not too Jewish. But uh, yeah, we borrow and the other religions borrow from us, which is a natural thing. Now, I want to go back a little bit regarding the bones. Now, we have one of the uh, prophets, Ezekiel, talks mm -hmm. about the issue of all the bones coming together. Right. Uh, so it's, it's a very uh, known thing to talk about the bones in Judaism, how they relate. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, Rabbi, Rom, uh, Rabbi Norman, um, correct me if I'm, when we say, <coughs> when we say El Male Rachamim, we talk about the soul joining the soul of all the tzaddikim or take me in to join them which uh it's the first time i'm thinking about it which is a kind of not exactly my set of beliefs into right. the issue of soul but right. but we talked about it now uh the other thing that i want to uh emphasize regarding issues that develop in Judaism uh, and regarding death. You know, for so, 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 so many years, our lives were just completely messy and painful and so forth. So authorities in the communities started talking on the next world, Olam Abba. And in Olam Abba, things are going to be really, really good. Uh, a life is only a, a hallway to that a great place that's called Olam Abba, that exactly I'm not sure what that means, but, but again, this is borrowed probably from other places. But that's an historical thing that happened in developing traditions based on what's going on now. The belief now we are suffering, but wait, in the next world, we'll be very uh, safe. 
Uh, the other thing that uh, maybe Rabbi Norman will talk about it is the issue, because I was asked this <laughs> last week, is the issue of going to Sheol, what Sheol is, to going to hell, if it exists, doesn't exist. Uh, so, so those are things that, uh, you know, there are so, so many ideas about it that, I, and I don't know, it's certainly not all of them. The other one that you said, Steve, of driving with the body, it's beyond that. Let's say that someone died on Friday night and you cannot bury on Shabbat. So the body stays and people are reciting Psalms, they live uh, while the body is over there. One personal experience that I had is you know that very religious people or whoever wants wash the body after the death. So we were a bunch of women and we were washing this body that I knew the person in the past. I knew the person. And when I looked at that body, it wasn't the person. It was a very, very strange um, mm -hmm. episode to me that I never forgot that that we are like a container and there is so much more to the person, to the human that exists there. You can call it soul or you can call it whatever you want. But for me, it was a very, very powerful experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, David, I think you and Wendy would like to say a few words. Wendy had something. Wendy? She is coming. She's on her way. Okay. I, I just want to discuss we can just change topic now. But speaking of, you know, and I know everybody's been saying, yes, the, I've had this experience and that experience. And um, there have been a couple of interesting experiences I've been through. Like when Helene was saying she saw, I think it was her grandmother being buried. My yeah. grandmother's funeral was the first funeral I ever went to. And it was open casket. And I had, you know, I had no idea what everything was going to be. But as soon as I walked past the casket and I saw my grandmother not looking anything like I remembered her, I just burst into sobs. And I, ever since then, I could never look into an open casket. And we've had things happen at some of the schools where I was teaching where students had, not through gang related things, but had died. And they were going to it was like the Catholic Church, and and I looked at a lot of my female, my girl students, and I said, "Girls, everybody's got to walk past that casket. Do not look in." And of course, they did, and they reacted the same way I did. Um, the other thing is, year, a few years ago, a friend of ours' daughter passed, and they were Orthodox. And when they were burying their daughter, it was I looked at what they, I guess you, they call the kosher casket. And it looked like somebody just took a whole bunch of two by fours, put them together and you could see holes <laughs> right through it. And I thought, oh no, David and I have kosher caskets that we can look like that too. But I, and I thought that was, I found that interesting. And to Rabbi Miri, when she was saying about Jewish tradition, after my dad passed, David was so good. He said Kaddish with me every single night until we had the unveiling. And the one beautiful, the, the beautiful thing about the Shiva and uh, Michael, we sat on boxes and we covered the mirrors and <laughs> we did all that. But and I felt good sitting on the box. But after the 11 months, when we got went over to the unveiling, you were ready to say goodbye. The Jewish tradition for mourning really helps you get through that mourning period and allows you that. So that was what I wanted to say. <laughs> Very well stated. Uh, yes, David, you, you said you wanted to say something too. No, that was, that was oh, a good one, Wendy. Right. Okay, thank you. Yes, Don. Just staying connected to the text for a second. <clears throat> we just left the scene where hundreds of thousands of firstborn were killed in one night. And I keep trying to place myself in those individual homes in the weeping in the morning on such a scale. I can only relate it to 
like modern warfare, like in the Ukraine, what's happening now, where where these high explosive re- weapons from remote launches are killing scores, if not hundreds, of people at once, just turning the country into a into a continual state of mourning. I don't see how we can read Exodus without thinking about that. There is, if we get across the sea today, I don't know if this, I do not know if we will, <laughs> but uh, but uh, there is a lot of commentary on that. And I'm going to ask you to uh, bring up your question uh, when we get to that. Okay, because it is important. It's very important. And, uh, and uh, I, I think it, it, the, the rabbis have made many, many comments over the centuries about that. Okay, so, it, but it, it, it does speed us to another discussion before we do this. But nobody has answered the original question. Why is it important to remember? Why do we go through these rituals to remember? What we, we're remembering the people, yes. But what's more than the people themselves? Yes, uh, uh, Steve. Well, memory, personal memory, is mm-hmm. very much an integral part of identity. So very I'm, good. I, I, actually, I I'm. I just happened to listen to a very moving audio book. Uh, it's called Still Susan. And actually the author of this book was at the book recent uh, Tucson uh, book uh, festival. But uh, it's about a woman who's a very accomplished uh, psychologist. All from her viewpoint as she gradually uh, is... Uh, you know, suffers the consequences of having early onset Alzheimer's at about age age fifty, and, and so you know that the the real real tragedy of Alzheimer's is you know your these people are are still healthy in body, but uh, they're they're not there anymore. Yeah, I understand what you. It is just robbed of them gradually. You know, yes. uh, even even though the the title of the book denies it, that there's something. You know, I'm I'm still me. You know, we want to be optimistic. I remember when my mother had Alzheimer's. You know, she was still a lovely person, but she she didn't know who I was. You know, she she at times she thought I was her father. You know, she it was just you know total confusion. But but. Just, I, I guess I'm digressing a little bit, but but I, I think, you know, at least part of your point was that both individually and, and nationally, memory is just a, a real part of how you define who, who you are. And that's lost. Uh, there's a real existential struggle going on as to who am I and who are we? Very, very good. Yes, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, I gave a sermon a couple of years ago playing on the remember is actually a, a connection of two words of re and member. Uh, you know, when you're talking about identity, right. you realize, realize that you are a member of a family, a people, a historical connection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, Yosef Yerushalmi, who was the professor of history, Jewish history at Hebrew University, wrote his his history of the Jewish people was entitled Remember. You know, that right. that this yeah. is this, this the, the whole process of who we are as a people is remembering or identifying and and connecting with not every single moment of Jewish history, but obviously uh, the 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 main themes. The, the values, et cetera, the challenges, the mitzvot, whatever. I think that's where you were going, Marty. Yes, and a little further, a little yeah. further. Uh, when we're remembering, each one of us have been talking about stories. 
stories involving our parents. Uh, but we concentrated on death. But do you remember the events you shared with your parents and grandparents? Okay. And those stories of remembering, you can extend it, as Steve and Rabbi were saying, you can extend that remembering process to friends, not just family members, but friends in the community. So what is remembered when you remember those people? Yes, Rabbi. Which one? Anyone. Yeah, Thank I you, Mary. Had her hand up. Yeah, I, oh, okay. I just oh, I'm to, sorry. I I uh, didn't see your hand up, Mary. I, I'm sorry. Uh, when I uh, lead a memorial or a funeral, uh, one of the things because you brought up the issue of soul, and people always ask about the soul. Where is it? What's happening? And my take on it is what you're saying, Marty. And it is all those memories, how this person touched you. And, and, and I'm asking the people on their personal stories of that touch. And then uh, there is that connect. That's how I call, that's what I call soul. I can elaborate on that, but this is one of the things that I try to say to the people that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, Rabbi. That's why Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that's why we talk of Sefer HaChayim. That's why we talk of the Book of Life. Life. Other cultures talk about the Book of Death. Right. Uh, okay, that when, someone, that when someone dies, they focus on the death. We still, as Miri is saying and as Marty is saying, we focus on the life, on the stories, on the relationships, on the lessons learned, on the experiences shared. It's the book. It's the book of life, and sometimes at funerals, I refer to it as the book for the living. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, yes, Don. Well, you know, <laughs> memory is very unreliable, and history is story. Uh, if you get a bunch of siblings in a room, and I, you know, they all try to remember some family, mm -hmm. they're all different, you know. And as they say, the History is written by the victors. So all we have is our stories. We don't know what really happened. Um, but the, the stories are what part of our culture. You know, we, we have to keep them, otherwise we have nothing. We, we, you know, we, we only have the present. So uh, yes. it's, uh, you know, I have lots of stories, and some of them are even true. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, Don, uh, you know what? The only thing that we have as humans is words. And the words describe something. And that something does not exist unless we call it. And what sure. we call, sometimes we have no idea what it is. But that connection, you know, um, that connection of uh, we don't know what happens right we don't know we can call it names but um that's all that what i have uh, you know if i say the next 12 that we say Aulamaba, i don't know how it looks i don't know what it is i don't know if you join your family i don't know i just give it a name so it exists at least in our minds. You need to remember the issue of words describing, and that's the narratives are so important. Okay. Yes, Lynn. Am I muted? Yeah. Um, another way to say this is um, that our stories with our words create our realities. Yes. Like so. And if we can, if we change our stories, we change our reality. I mean, and this has um, been subject to a lot of research about, you know, but what was happening in the brain. So remembering is telling a story, creating a reality that brings that memory alive. Right. It actually is with us at that moment. That's right. That's perfect. 
Uh, so memory is really, and it's not a thing, it's an action. You are remembering what was going on. If you don't remember an iconic image, you remember an event, the story. So, so it is an, it, it, think, of, think of it as moving, it, it, it was something that moved you. In the with your loved one, with your parent, your children, every and it goes on and on. Things you saw, events you witnessed, that you bring back to memory. It, everything is is centered around action, and those. It, it, uh, in, in addition, in addition to that, it's how you re acted or were involved in that event. And it's okay if it changes, because along the way you learn other ways of describing things. <laughs> and it may sound better over time. But at the same time, it, it is critical because in addition to just remembering those events, you also remember the teachings of your parents, the teachings of the rabbis that you came in contact with, the teachings of your friend, and they did it by their behavior. What you're remembering is what they did and what they spoke, not just the image of that person. Marty, what we remember yeah. very, very powerful is how we felt about things. Yeah. And someone very close to me that was abused by the parents, that feeling of being abused is still carried still, with you. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. That happens. Sure. And so I just wanted to say, that this passage is very, very important. It's not just remembering the image of Joseph. It's the memory of a people. It's the memory of all the other uh, patriarchs. The, in, current, in, in, in more current thinking, we add in the matriarchs, which is good because they had something to do and say as well. So, yes, I, I know I'm stimulating. Uh, Lynn, I think you wanted to say something before I, I get into a pontification. <laughs> Lynn and, and then Rab, uh, uh, Rabbi and Steve, I'm not sure, but I see hands popping up. Did you have anything you wanted no, to add? No. Okay. Okay, Rabbi and then Steve. No, I just would, when you said about the matriarchs, it is said just a little bit they had to say, that just a little bit. Right. <laughs> but, but traditionally, they were teachers. No question. They, they were important teachers. They taught the custom. And prophets. Miriam is Yes, we're going to get to that. Deborah is considered a prophet. Yes. No. We're, we're going to get to that. If we, I don't know when, but you know, at the when we get to the other side of the Red Sea, all that discussion will take place too. Yes, Steve. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to mention, you know, that your whole discussion, which was very good and very apropos about stories and how it's personal, it reflects yes. our relations with with people. Anyone who has not encountered StoryCorps that's uh, played on NPR is exactly about what you're you're describing. These as a this is a like booth that goes around the country for years. They've been and it's just regular people just go into the booth and they tell story about themselves and their significant other or two brothers, two sisters come in together and talk. But this is like really nice and not celebrities, you know, just people off the street do it. And these, uh, these uh, discussions are, well, these like brief storytellings are archived. And so they, they play them on uh, NPR from time to time. They have regular times when they 
play these. Some of them are pretty old and, uh, you know, people have passed away, but still the stories are always, uh, even of minor things are in, in some, on some level, they're, they're very moving and they're very personal, even if they don't involve you. So again, yeah, story core. And it's probably a podcast too. I imagine it is on NPR. Now, uh, going back to the issue of stories, uh, we are coming by the most important story that uh, in, in the Jewish tradition, it's coming up. And the story is to teach the children because children, yes. well, we too, but children learn the best through stories. And that's why I emphasize time and after time that uh, it's our story. It's right. not the story of the Hebrews. It's not the story of the Jews because we become part of the story because we were in Sinai, we remember, we crossed the sea, we. And uh, when the story is personal, as you saw, you know, so many of you uh, told a personal story, it becomes a story of the listener as well. Yes. So anyway, uh, that's the stories that coming up. This was a preview. Okay, and we will not go into Greek mythology. Okay, when you toss out teeth and they grow back <laughs> into the people, but the warriors. But uh, it, it is, uh, I just wanted to, dig to take this opportunity to digress because it's a very important question that that was raised when you know this comes out of the blue there's a whether you want to believe 400 plus years or you want to have 200 plus years as some people have suggested i don't know but i'm going to go with what we're told in the torah yes yes Rabbi. Marty, i don't understand what do you mean it comes out of the blue well it's not mentioned there's a hiatus of 400 years before this is you, mentioned. You're again. talking specifically about bring my bones out or remembering the the patriarchs. This is one of it's 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 just coming out. This whole we're filling in a lot of the material from the book of Exodus because this takes us all the way back through that. So are we are we making the well, we have are to we make the assumption, are they practicing the religion? Are are we making the assumption that Mr. and Mrs. Egyptian Israelite um you know did not tell their children all the stories that that, that we're referring to right now? They didn't tell them the stories of their grandparents and whatever and what happened with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and just it really come out of come out of the blue and say, Oh, incidentally. We want you to know there was this guy named Joseph, and we're going to honor him by getting his bones. I'm just saying we have to fill that in with Midrash because we don't know. The text does not say that. No, we do. We we That's don't. Right. We we don't know, but we do know Jewish parents. Okay. And grandparents. Good. Good. That, that's what I was. And trying we know to how up. much they like to tell stories. So I believe. But like I said, Mr. and Mrs. Egyptian yes. Israelite did pass on a lot of the history yes. stories. On the same time, on the same token, uh, Rabbi Norman, uh, Moshe had to introduce the God of not being seen or whoever. So that piece was missing somehow from the narrative. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, Don. Don, you're muted. You're muted, Don. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, I find this uh, discussion really good because I have an MFA in writing and I've published a novel and some short stories. And so I'm kind of always embedded in the idea of story. And, um, and particularly biblical stories, because um, the detail was so important. You know, the, the 
about carrying Joseph's bones. Is it is a tremendously powerful image that you can never forget. Um, Moses and the Israelites carrying those bones all across the desert. So I really zero in on that stuff. I mean, it's the, it's a masterful story. And uh, anyway, I, I'm starting to ramble again here. But, uh, it's okay. It's okay. No, it's it's worthwhile. It, Michael, did you have your hand up again? Oh, okay. I, th I thought I saw it up. Any other comments about this verse? I think after uh, an hour, I think we can move on. <laughs> we didn't get very far, but that's okay. Uh, so uh, uh, either... Uh, Either well, David, why don't you you write uh, you read? I mean, uh, verses uh, uh, twenty one through twenty two, uh, twenty through uh, twenty two. And and they took their journey from Sukkot, and encamped in Etham on the in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them by the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might go by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night departed not from before the people. Okay. Any comments about this? I know in, uh, a few weeks ago, it was brought to our attention about the possibility of volcanic activity, you know, and, and like that. Um, Okay, any any comments about it from the uh, philosophical side? David, I know you're thinking. Well, we uh, touched Phil, on- You want a philosophical, philosophical sure, thing? Sure, okay. Philosophical. Even when, you th even when you think that you understand God, recognize that it's still cloudy and it's still difficult to you know to see even when it's bright sunshine but god's presence the divine whatever is still very very difficult to understand and and it's it, at times when it's so dark outside that you're losing your way god's presence can be a brilliant fire that you know the that illuminates illuminates the way and uh you know it, it guides the path if you will there's your philosophical thing there you go okay. but but it's it's it, it, it's all, it, it's important to under you know to to verbalize that that as a series of emotions that that these can represent and hope for a better future it, it's it's sort of moving the story <laughs> from a separation of the past uh, it, to the pres through the present into a a better future, you can look at it that way too. And and also, uh, you know, again, it's like we were just saying about through that through that whole four hundred plus year, you know, history. Where where was God, either in story or in experience? <laughs> Now this is a this is a sim a symbolic. God's presence is always there, right. in the in the center of the camp. And when when God's present move, we move and at, at, and 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 on and on and on. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Lynn. You're. you're okay, I'm now. I'm there you go. Okay. Um, yeah. As a um, art historian and a visual learner. I wanted to point out the power, not only of words, but of images and what we see. Um, it goes maybe to a different part of the brain, I believe, like words are more left brain, so to speak, and images are more right brain. But the um, image of something guiding us is the interpretation. Um, powerfully speaks to our inner world, of not being alone, being accompanied um, in a way that 
can't be transmitted by just the words alone. The words I am with you and the image together are much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Very, very well stated. Uh, uh, Don and Steve. Uh, yeah, you mentioned, you asked about the philosophical theme. Please. Um, I, I was just reading my mom at my mom and uh, he was he's really big on the symbolic uh, images, and he discounted that these events actually occurred. And you know, he kind of connects to Aristotle who thought the cosmos could never change; it was like eternally stable, and that these events were only stories. But I. I I personally believe that these things really happened and that they were quite visible and they and the and these uh, catastrophes really occurred. So I think since Maimonides and right about that same time is when um, all kinds of metaphysical Jewish um, discussion began. Um, so I think Personally, I think there was, is it, there's so much emphasis now on the sim symbolism of these things, but I don't know if there'll ever be a return to a discussion of whether they really occurred. Um, so, although you're asking about the philosophical meaning, I, I keep coming back to the physical history. I really. Okay. Okay. I think Don, Don, that's one of the deep ways of looking at Torah, in which you don't remain on the specific words, but you look beyond it. Um, it was called by Rabbi Norman philosophical, but, um, but it's, it's symbolic, it's metaphorical, and it, it's a deeper way of looking at it. I can say, you know, the, the, the cloud is, it clouds my eyes. I, I cannot see anything. I'm just completely depressed. I mean, I can metaphorically see, oh, I see the, the, the light that comes from the fire. So what you're saying about the symbols, I very much vote for. Well, you like my mom today, so. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Rabbi, oh yes, Steve, please. Um, well, I wanted to share some comments actually by Hertz and some of, was, own, go ahead. Some, some of my own that, of course, you know, there's always a little bit of a, uh, of a struggle to reconcile um, certain, uh, you know, visible, very visible, very dramatic um, images, with uh, the very important concept of, of God being um, not definable. God does, our God does not have a location, does not have an appearance. Um, but, you know, here, uh, you know, there's, there's a need for um, some sort of a tangible presence. Or, or indicator of presence. So, so that is the uh, the cloud by day and the uh, fire by night. And there are a lot of other um, incidents of yes. very dramatic images. But we keep in mind that um, you know our God is uh, is not something definable or locatable or even restricted in time. Um, now, now. Uh, Hertz has some interesting comments about the, uh, and, and one of them is, uh, and this might be familiar with, uh, to some people, I don't have a, enough of a basic and basic knowledge of English literature to, to this, to be aware of this reference, but um, he says that uh, Sir Walter Scott, based uh, on this uh, story of the uh, cloud and p pillar of uh, a fire and the cloud. Uh, the one of the most beautiful religious songs in English literature, Rebecca's hymn. I'll have to look that up. 
and and he also uh, mentions that, quoting other commentators, that Luzado and Kalish refer to the Orient yes. custom of fire signals in right. front of armies or of a brazier filled with burning wood borne along at the head of a caravan as a natural basis of this particular miracle. In other words, this was sort of an adaption of something that was customarily done, that there was some sort of fire at the head of the caravan or at the head of the, of the army. So, and he mentions that this is an interweaving of the supernatural and natural within uh, scriptures. Very good. I have that, but the, I found another one. Rabbi Plout, for those of you who may have the Plout uh, commentary, uh, clearly, however, the uh, and the however refers to all of these discussions. Uh, clearly, however, the cloud, especially in its fiery appearance, was an aspect of a tradition in which the presence of God was experienced to the accompaniment of flame, burning bush. Okay. Uh, Abraham is granted the vision of the covenant in, a, in such a way. Uh, in Genesis 15, 17, Moses hears God's voice in the burning bush. Exodus 3, verse 2. And the grand revelation at Sinai occurs with thunder and lightning as, so, as well as a dense cloud. Exodus 19, 16, we haven't gotten uh, uh, to some of these, uh, and some we have. Uh, fire is the co concretized symbol of man's awe, and the descending mist of a cloud, a tactile encounter with heavenly forces. The cloud came to be viewed as God's messenger, and popular memory enshrined uh, enshrined it as another manifestation of divine protection and guidance. So that's Rabbi Plout's take on it. So it, it's a uh, so I think we uh, you know we we certainly can look at this, and then we also know. God can make it appear as just about anything. And sometimes it's, it's our interpretation of the image. It, it's, it's, sort of think, it's sort of amorphous. And some people may think of it as a cloud. Some people may see a, a pillar of fire. Some people may see a, the burning bush. Uh, some people there's a, there's a whole series of ways in which God just decides to appear to influence or, or the people interpret that appearance. Yes, Steve. Yeah, and, and just interestingly, it goes beyond our own culture. The use of fire or the image of fire as some sort of divine manifestation um, in the, the Zoroastrians have what you might call yes. a, a ner to meet. <laughs> they they got a fire, you know, that has to burn all the time and never goes out. And uh, at least one of the Indian tribes has this custom as well, to my knowledge, and might be the Navajo, that at one point there, there, there was some sort of uh, fire that can never be extinguished that has to, you know, have to feed uh, uh, kindling into it to, to keep it going and just something that's been going on forever, so. Okay, any other comments or, or side remarks or that people want to, okay. We're, we're making a lot of headway because now we are on in Exodus 14. Uh, Michael isn't there right now. Uh, uh, David, why don't you uh, read verses one? Well, any any comments for, first of all uh, about? Uh, well, no, it's okay. Uh, we'll move on. We can save that for uh, another five years from now when we start all over again. <laughs> anyway, the Lord said to Moses, uh, verse one, uh, Exodus fourteen one. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, but he bare the child of Shelah saying, Speak unto the children 
of Israel that they turn back and encamp before by by Ephra oath between Migdo and the sea before Baal Zephron over against it and shall ye encamp by the sea. And Pharaoh shall say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he shall follow after them. And I will get me honor from Pharaoh upon Pharaoh and upon all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Okay, let's stop at that point. A big question. Verse one. It's very short. The Lord said to Moses. End of the verse. It's awfully short. And it doesn't. In other cases, it's carried on through to what God said. This is a pause, an intentional pause. Why, why this pause? Dramatic ideas. Yes, Steve. Oh, okay. No, 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 you know, you know not, not, not to give you a hard time over this, but... Um, uh, you, you have to remember that there's no punctuation in the Torah originally. That's right. Or that's an actual real pause, pause that was inserted afterwards uh, as sort of after the fact. But the verse is still there. It's a short verse. But, but, but it's not a, but it's not a short verse. It's just, you see, the, see the whole narrative is a, is a continuity. It's, there is no punctuation. Okay, that's what... the pause and there is no end of a sentence. One sentence is go, goes into another. But somebody somewhere along the way, at any time, whether it was an addition to everything, they separate this intentionally into verse one and verse two. Like I said, dramatic effect. Dramatic effect. Okay. Very good. Uh, Lynn and then Don. Um, I noticed that it's a different Hebrew word. Usually it's Vayomer Adonai El Moshe Lemur, and this is Vaydaber Adonai El Moshe Lemur. And sometimes in English we say Vayomer is he said, and Vaydaber is he spoke. So there is a stronger action. Mm -hmm. Speak, speaking is creating in a way, in some yes. way, creating something new, new, like speaking the world into creation. And God said, let there be light. Ah, very good. Very good. Well, anyway, so it's like. That's sort of where, <laughs> almost where I was going with this. Uh, yeah, yes, Don, please. I think Lynn answered my question, thank you, because I was going to ask the, the root, those two adjacent words, saying and speak, what the Hebrew root of those words were, and whether it would be confusing to have them not separated by uh, a verse break. Okay, very Marty, good. Yes. If, if I may, most biblical scholars relying on, on the Hebrew would say you don't really translate Lemur. Lemur basically just means colon or quote. Okay. Okay, so it's not, uh, you know, uh, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, it's just Adonai spoke to Moses, quote, that, you know, da, 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 da. so uh, that's, uh, you know, as compared to the older translations, the more modern translations, the more critical translations linguistically would say that's what the lay more really means. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Michael. It, would it be different if it said, and the Lord said to Moses, r rather than the Lord said to Moses? Would well, it does say and in Hebrew. No, it doesn't. Vai the bear? The vav there means that you change the, change the tense. Because the, ver the verb's in the, in the future, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, Michael, did you have something? I, I saw your hand flip. Did you 
Yeah, I was just uh, waiting for um, to hear what um, everyone had to say. Oh, okay. Okay. Please, Suzanne. Uh, just real quick, um, in my version, verse one says, and it does say, and the Lord uh, spoke. I don't know if that means anything, but since the question quick, was, quick, please, what if it said, okay, and quick, quick lesson, quick lesson, the, the, the Vav, which historically was translated as, and really is just a, just a, um, um, what's the right word? It's an instruction to change the tense because the verb is there written in the future tense. So it wouldn't be, and God will speak if you're writing a narrative, if you're t telling the story. Uh, so, it, it had, so they determined 110, 120 years ago in understanding the, the biblical grammar that it really, it's not really and. It's just, it's a change the change the tense of the verb that follows. Oh, okay. And the opposite, if, if it appears in the past. Right, it, exactly, exactly, future. sure. <laughs> okay. And there, and there, there are certainly, there are times when that, the vow does mean and. And, yeah. But, but not, not, but not usually when there's before a verb. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's called it's called vav aipuch. The vav they make it upside down. Or reverses it. You're right. Reverse. There's reverses. Okay. No. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'm thinking of the book of Numbers right now with the vavs <laughs> upside down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So when we get to that, uh, right. please. Like we make so on our own. That's right. Please, uh, Steve. Uh, Marty. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Just st still on this subject of the Hebrew and the peculiar things that happen with Hebrew tenses. Um. And I, I, I want to get some backing or, or comments on the Hebrew speakers here as to whether I understand this correctly or not, but. Even in modern Hebrew, uh, when something, and I just remember this from basic training <laughs> in the Israeli army, when you got a lot of orders from, you know, your, your a squad leader or your, you know, your company commander, and when they wanted to tell you something that was, you know, you're definitely going to be here in 10 minutes, they would use the past tense. They would say, <laughs> Hayitem kan baod esrim shniot. You know, it's, it, it's sort of like like sort of an a, a peculiar use of the past tense, but it's something that's going to happen in the future. But they're so certain that this is going to happen that you use the past tense because the only thing we're ever certain about is the past. We're, you're you can't really be certain about the future ever, right? But but you know if you're if you've got something that's going to happen in the future and you're just there's no two ways about it this is going to happen you, you use the past tense again yeah I, yeah I don't know if that's just my peculiar take on it or what but that was a very sort of peculiar construct that I encountered a lot in basic training so interesting <laughs> when you're commanded to do something and this is uh, also commanding troops in Torah. Mm -hmm. The Israelites have come, come out of Egypt troop by troop, and they are armed. We've read that. Interesting that, that Steve brought that into the discussion. So maybe that's a custom. I don't know if it's well, well, that, and, and that's even without Vavahipok. You don't know, yeah. read Vavahipok and that construct. There was just, you know, a peculiar use of the past tense for something that's going to happen in the future, but you're real sure about it. So you use the past tense. <laughs> Hebrew is peculiar. Thank you. Oh, yes, Lynn. And you need to know, you need oh. to know that this love is when you study Hebrew seriously. You have Hebrew and you have Torah Hebrew because it's not exactly the same. It's true. Yes, Lynn. 
So just to be picky, <laughs> back in verse um, 17, which starts by okay. he, my translation translates it as the beginning of a sentence, and it happened. So they translate, even though it's it's a revert, it's a vavha hipuch, they still translate it with the and. Sure, sure, sure. Gr okay. Grammatically, but it's you're not. You're talking clear. about uh, 14, in a literary 17? style. You know, 13, 17. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, I mean the a frequent phrase is in Hebrew vai, in in the in Torah vaihi achar hadvarim ha'ela. It came to pass, right. or it will come to pass after these things. Yeah, it, it's, and it's also, kind of Lynn, uh, right. yeah, Lynn, In this case, it depends on the nekudot. It depends on the vowels because after that you have what we call chataf patach, and that's why the vav ve turns into a. So it's a mix here of new Hebrew with nekudot, with vowels that before didn't exist, to put it, that sounds like as if it's a ipuch, but it's a regular end. It, <laughs> it's a pain. I studied digduk and it's a pain. <laughs> right. Oh, lots of exams in this. But, um, and as, as Marty has said, and as we've said many, many times, every translation is is a commentary mm -hmm. you know and and you have either intentional or unintentional biases that 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 flip in there or just a particular literary style there's there's nothing wrong in a literary sense from adding the conjunctive word and but grammatically it's that's not why the vav is there it might make more sense to you know, to connect the previous verse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but um, uh, but grammatically, that's the purpose of the vav. So I'll now just from my other studies, vav is a very important letter, being within the tetragrammaton yud hey vav hey, right, and it symbolizes yeah. the world of connection, world of ruach in the four worlds theory. And um, the actual form of it is said to be a hook. So it's a very, it's what connects things, one thing to another. And um, so it's the symbol of the world mm -hmm. of Yitzi Ra, as far as I know, which is the world of creation. Um, and um, they, I think the form, the theme of it is Ruach. Scary. Right. And the other, the other Kabbalistic thing is that the the vav in the tetragrammaton in the four letters of God's name, okay, is is really an extension of the yud, which stands for God God's name. Yeah. So it, you know you make it you make a a, a connection between uh, uh, lengthening or or extending the yud on to become a vav. And that connects us and connects the present, past, future, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's it's the beauty of the letter working with the letters. Right. And while we're on it, um, I know that there were are some um, Torah scrolls that are written in the style where above is the first letter of right. every column. I'm right. not sure what what the mystical meaning of, but it's just a really important letter. I don't. I don't think. Uh, yeah, and and both of both of the scrolls at Beth Shalom Temple Center are what's called a, a you know a, 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 a vav amude. It's that that the vav is, and it's not every single every single column. There are there are some there are at least two, if not three, columns um, in the entire Torah that don't have that don't have the vav. But it's a um, it's, um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure somebody has come up with some uh, you know, mystical interpretations to it, but it's almost like a challenge to the, to the software, to the scribe, to make it, to make it work. Nowadays they do it with lasers, but, uh, but originally it was like a challenge to the scribe to make it happen because you had to anticipate, you know, about five or six sentences beforehand to be able to make sure that the first, first letter of each column was above. It, it, and it also added 
additional value and cost to the, to the scroll. Interesting. We're learning something every, new every day. <laughs> well, now the rest of it, uh, the story goes on to, uh, uh, to say that, uh, that uh, the Israelites are, are uh, to turn back and encamp before, uh, 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 what is it, uh, Piharoth, Piharoth, Piharoth. Uh, between Migdol and the sea, uh, before ba Baal Zephon, and uh, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. Uh, and Marty, then, Marty, yes, if I may, just just for those who are following along in the Hebrew, the first word in verse three is, as Rabbi Miri was saying, there's an example where the verb is in the here is written in the past tense, but because there's a vav. You have to understand it in the future tense. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you Otherwise, it would say, right. and they Pharaoh came will back. Say, not Pharaoh had said. Ah. Okay. So it, it just Pharaoh says that they that they've gone astray. They they're, they're lost. Uh, th th that the wilderness has closed in on them. Uh, and any comments about that? Steve, you spoke about a military action. Any comments about this? In dueling, I, I, I envision a, a lunge and parry. Or faint. Yes. I would uh, say just one very, very quick thing. In Hebrew, it says, and, and you're going to camp on the sea. At first, it says in front of the sea, but then it says, which is interesting. I need to look at it again uh, to understand. First, it says, that's in front. But then it says, Alayam, on the sea. Interesting. One thing that I would like to say here is that yes, the, uh, thank you, is that the wilderness has shut them in. The wilderness is the wilderness. The desert is the desert. It doesn't move. It stays as it is pretty much. It is our perception. And I think what the scripture here is trying to tell us is our perception that we're being shut in when we really are not. Okay, that's good. That's a, it's a good uh, statement there. Any other comments? Um, militarily speaking, uh, this is a very wise maneuver because you are you are intending one uh, one behavior militarily, but you're you're doing something that's going to make your opponent think otherwise. Okay, y yes, Don. In well, a previous chapter, we learned that uh, God had directed Moses and Aaron not to take the northerly route, which had, would have led everybody into confrontation with um, the Phoenicians up that way. Um, and so they are, that's why they are taking this route to the east. Okay. Did you want to expand on that in any way? Well, I'm just wondering whether it was an additional strategic decision or whether that was enough. If they were just told, okay. go to the east, don't go to the north. There may be different uh, midrash necessary to fill in this the answers to the, some of these questions. Steve, your hand was up, I thought, for a while. 
Oh, um, well, well, I, actually, I just, I'm, I'm sorry. It's a little bit of a digression, but just what, what, what occurred to me because we were making the discussion of the interesting grammar of Hebrew in switching back and forth, future and past, and uh, uh, it it reminded me of of the fact that you know our God is not only uh, not uh, definable in location; He is also not definable in time. Time is a human perception. Um, you know that, and and this is more of a. We were talking philosophy before. You know, there are uh, philosophers who say that you know, from it's it's just for our own perception. We have to see things as as a sequence, but uh, God doesn't. You know, it's uh, he he is sort of as uh, Kurt Vonnegut would say, unglued in time. Right. That's uh, <laughs> that's a slaughterhouse five. I think. Uh, it just um, it, it's a fluid state. Woody Allen said that uh, that um, that time was uh, something invented by God, so everything doesn't happen at once. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very. True. It's just for all. I don't know if uh, Marty or Steve said that this was a good strategy. I don't think it was a good strategy. And the Egyptians did not think it was a good strategy because they uh -huh. camp in front of the sea. So now they are closed. They have the sea and they have the, the desert. So that doesn't, it doesn't sound too smart, you know, unless they trust God that he's going to do something about it. But in reality, and then Pharaoh said, you know, don't worry. They are now caught between this and that. Okay. Okay, good point. Excellent point. Uh, Don and then, and then Lynn. Just a quick uh, correction to Steve. It was Mandel brought the IBM mathematician who said the purpose of time is... Uh, it was who? I'm sorry. No, what's the correction? Mandelbrot, and he also said the purpose of space is to keep it from all happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lynn. Just a little aside, <clears throat> that there is um, actual Egyptian texts talking about um, going and pursuing escaped slaves, that they're in the annals of the Egyptian government or probably in papyrus, not on, not carved in stone, but they actually have records of so-and-so went out and captured so-and-so slaves. Now, does this precede or the... It's uh, around the same time. It, for, for, uh, I, don't, I, I don't remember, it was right before or right after. Does it, well, does this... I assume it's more in the new, it's that it's somewhere in the new kingdom. Okay. The, the reason I asked, there is a commentary that I came across stating that uh, God, uh, uh, that uh, Manasseh uh, 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 led a, a group of Israelites out of Egypt before the actual Exodus, oh, and I that the Egyptians a and that the Egyptians caught up with them and slew them. Yeah. And that God did not want for the Israelites to see the bones of the uh, of the other Israelites that had been, been killed by the Egyptians. I and so story, the, the, yeah. he has a very meandering route now. Again, it's it's Midrash, you know, uh, one of many. Uh, that, it's uh, actually it's in the Targum Jonathan. I don't know if that's okay. considered midrash, midrash. I guess it is, but yes. I heard it. I heard it was the tribe of Ephraim. Not that it makes much difference, but um, Ephraim, I'm, I'm okay. talking Ephraim, about Ephraim, that's Ephraim. Yeah. You are correct. You that's are correct. from our text. I'm correcting. talking about there's actual Egyptian text. Okay, talking about that they did not want to let slaves run away. It wasn't like, oh, there's only a, 
I mean, this was a couple of slaves. This wasn't a, a, a big group, and they didn't even want to let a couple leave. Okay. And, uh, and yes, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Roman. Kind of an aside, although we've mentioned Maimonides a couple times today. So uh, uh, Maimonides' famous Guide to the Perplexed is in Hebrew is Moren Nevuchim, is a, is a guide or teaching those who are confused, confounded, it's the same, same adjective here. Okay. And if I remember correctly, in, in the preface, uh, Maimonides, Rambam, includes a reference to this particular phrase. And just like the Israelites were confounded because God was telling them to encamp here, and they knew that they were surrounded. There's water on this side, and they're surrounded by this, and the Egyptians are going to be coming, and da 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 just like we may feel totally perplexed, confounded, as trying to understand God's plan this guide will provide you with the guide, you know, the, 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 the way to find yourself out of the confusion. If I remember correctly, it's either Maimonides himself or one of the, one of the classical commentators on Maimonides' book. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So getting back to the land of the complex, uh, indeed, uh, fair, uh, f f uh, it's stated by God that Pharaoh will say to the, uh, will say of the Israelites that they are astray in the land. They don't know where they're going, uh, it, which is interesting because today, if anyone does crossword puzzles, if somebody is that way, they are a C, A S E A. So now you'll remember that you can use that, but no pun intended. Uh, they are astray in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. Then I will stiffen Pharaoh's heart. So again, Pharaoh's heart is going to be stiffened. And he will pursue them that I may assert my authority against Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, Steve. No, just a, what might be a pretty dumb question, but I, I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. How does Pharaoh know the location of the people? Does he have a satellite view GPS on the people of Israel, or? You know, he's he's back in his throne room. He knows where they are. <laughs> How? <laughs> Throw in it, make up your own drush, spies. <laughs> okay. When, yeah. You know what, yeah. uh, Steve, when Moshe comes to Pharaoh, to Paro, and says, let my people go to the desert and worship me. Yeah. And mm -hmm. worship. So uh, there was probably a site in which they were worshiping, which I always uh, puzzles me, me, because it tells that they did they did um, sacrifice a word, maybe an Abdu, uh, some kind of god in the desert. They didn't want to do it on Egypt land. So probably there was a site in which they went. And probably there is only one way that they could have gone. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, and then there are the, um, you know, there are the, uh, the steps that were left by them. They were a lot. No, but uh, I think that that's the issue, that there was only one way, and that's where they usually went to uh, worship. They, they, that what you allude to, the marching, sure, that they'd kick up the dust and you'd see that where they are. Uh, yeah, okay, Don, I, rap, I, I, I don't know who had their hands up first. Go ahead, Rabbi. Go ahead, Rabbi. Okay. Go ahead, Rabbi. Go ahead. Okay, Rabbi, you're on. If God could intervene so much to harden or stiffen Pharaoh's heart, God could also tell Pharaoh. This is the direction that they went. Yeah. 
good point. But more, done. more likely, yeah. like others are saying, that that uh, Moses, you know, in the previous negotiations or whatever, said this is the this is where we would be going. This is the direction to the promised land. This, you know, this, et cetera, et cetera. So the, he was aware of what the direction was. Okay. He, and also the, the, the route. I would assume that he, that Pharaoh would have made the, the assumption that the the route of the Philistines was the easiest route out of there. And they had also deviated from that mm -hmm. into the wilderness. Yes, Don. Uh, Rabbi Roman hit on my hobby horse again about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Um, and, and by the way, I don't think it's too hard to find, for a million people to see where they went. <laughs> Um, but um, if he, I mean, if God keeps hardening Pharaoh's heart when he might have said, okay, you know, we've learned our lesson, let him go. But now he's being forced again into a, uh, a fatal maneuver. So he, he, he just is not standing a chance here. You know, he's, he's not being allowed to concede God's power. He has to. Now, Excuse my editorial, but it seems like God is keeps rubbing his nose, and you know, it seems like he already conceded. He already threw his hands up, and yet now he's going to have to face another slaughter. So I, you know, I thought way back after three plagues, he might have given up and let him go. He had a, anyway. I think this is the last time that Pharaoh's heart is pardoned by God. So my lips are sealed now. Thank you. Okay. A any other comment? Uh, yes, Lynn. Just a minor comment, but it's kind of interesting. So Robert Alter um, mm -hmm. points out that there is um, an echo in the Hebrew of Pharaoh's pride and arrogance. Yes. In the way he he um, he speaks, he says, you know, th there's like a little phrase, like he's Nuvohim Haim Baaretz, Sagar Alehem Hamid Bar. It's like a poet, poetic, like echoing the song of the sea, which will come. Yes. But it's like very, very deliberate, you know, and he's pro prophesying, oh, they're gonna be caught. And he's Part of the reason that um, retribution came back on the Egyptians was pride goeth before a fall, you know, lots of pride. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. That's going to come up as, as, the, as you say, and then it, the, that part of that theme is also going to come up uh, again uh, after the crossing of the, of the Reed Sea. Well, that's a good place to, to stop any, unless anyone has any other comments. Uh, any announcements, Ruthann? Now, uh, next Saturday, we have uh, our Saturday Shabbat service, which is also the first day of Passover. And then we have a uh, Kiddush luncheon afterwards. It will be Passover style. I can say that. Uh, we're keeping as much kosher for Passover as possible. We will have some gluten-free options. I bought some gluten-free macaroons yesterday. And Maradell is going to make some gluten-free cheesecakes. Mm. So it should be very interesting. Um, but, but like I said, it's, it's hard to find everything you need <laughs> in Southern Arizona. So um, if, if you're if you're somebody who's keeping totally for Passover, um, I'll let you know what you can and cannot eat on okay. Saturday. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, I hope to see everybody on Saturday. And then the following week, we resume Torah studies after our uh, service on April 22nd, which we will also have Yisker. Okay. Yes, Rabbi. You know, also, just a reminder invitation. If there's anybody who, who does not have a Seder officially we are recording one we're going to re it, it will be available uh online as of what probably sometime thursday or friday morning it'll uh, be available hope 
Oh, Pro oh, oh. Probably, probably when I mean, what Thursday? Maybe even Wednesday night. Okay. Well, Wednesday night. It all depends if uh, if I get the link. You know, right. if you think if you think you're going to be good one time through, then we can. I will be good one time through. One time I'm, through, I'm then promise. everybody can have the link. They can even watch the filming then. Well, okay. So if you need, if you need a recorded Seder to you know to watch along, if you 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 don't have a place to be with others uh we are providing that that recorded seder for okay. for people so i wish everybody a chag sameach, chag sameach. Uh, this is bezach. <laughs> yes thank you before it goes i, I want to thank everyone for the, the participation today it was really good